Good day, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar. I hope you all can hear me. Uh, my name is uh, Helen Nielsen. I'm Event and Marketing Coordinator at Interacoustics, and uh, I'll be today's moderator. Um, Lee Martin, our audiologist and internal, international clinical trainer, will be today's presenter. Uh, you will hear from him in a few seconds. Um, before we start, I just have a few practical informations to give you. You have all been muted, and um, this is mainly done in order to reduce any background noise and to make it a, a, a more comfortable experience for all of us. All questions will be handled in the end uh, of the webinar. In the meantime, please feel free to type them in uh, to the instant message box, which you will find on your left side of the screen. I will collect all questions during the webinar, and uh, at the end, in the Q&A session, uh, Lee will uh, answer them. The webinar will, rec will be recorded. We had a similar webinar yesterday, and it was recorded as well, and we will have a look at both recordings afterwards and find the best one. And it will be available online in the beginning of, of next week. If any of you have any questions during the webinar or experience any problems at all, then please send me an email just directly to my email address. You will find it here. It's hgn at interacoustics.com. We expect that the webinar will take approximately approximately 45 minutes, and then there will be room for Q&As afterwards. So again, feel free to type any questions in during the webinar. This is all for me now. Uh, I want to give the presentation back to Lee Martin. Well, thank you very much, Hella, and good morning, everybody. My name's Lee Martin, and uh, I'm an audiologist and international clinical trainer working for the Interacoustics Academy. For those of you that don't know the function of the Academy, uh, we have the role of providing audiological training and support to uh, clinicians regarding the new technologies in audiology. One of these new technologies which is very hot in the world of uh, ENT and audiology currently is the video head impulse test. So we've decided to dedicate this webinar to looking at assessing all six semicircular canals using the video head impulse test. We will continue this series of webinars regarding the video head impulse test and complete the series by doing a webinar on interpretation of the VHIT results. So what we're going to do today is really focus on the VHIT setup and then performing the technique in the lateral and the vertical canals. I'll finish the, the webinar off by doing a little introduction into the interpretation, but as I mentioned, what we'll do is focus a lot of the time next time on that area. So when we're talking about the V-hit, uh, what we're actually doing is we're measuring something known as the vestibular ocular reflex. Now with the vestibular ocular reflex, it's really important that we have a solid understanding of how this reflex works before we start actually talking about testing it. What I want to do today is explain the VOR, or vestibular ocular reflex, in a really simple way. I don't want to look at the complex neuroanatomy diagrams or talk about the complex pathways associated with it. What I want to do is to give you a clinical understanding of what the purpose of the VOR is, and we can use that information to then look what happens in people with normal vestibular function and those with abnormal vestibular function. So in order to demonstrate how the VOR works, what I've done is I have actually made a video of me performing a task which is uh, using my vestibular ocular reflex. What you'll see is that I have my eyes focused ahead on a target. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to now start to move my head from left to right and then see if my eyes can maintain focus on the target. So as I move my head from left to right, we can see it looks like my eyes are stood still. Uh, but in fact what's happening is as my head is moving, my eyes are moving in an equal and opposite direction. Now what tells my eyes to move in an equal and opposite direction is the vestibular ocular reflex. 
So a really important point to remember is that vestibular ocular reflex in a normal patient will tell your eyes to move in an equal and opposite direction to the head. Let's now get you to do a task to use your VOR. So what we have now is the target on the screen which you can see and what I want you to do is look at that target. Whilst looking at that target is move your head from left to right just as I was doing in the, in the video. Now what you can notice is that you should be able to maintain your vision on the target. If you can't maintain your vision on the target then this can tell you that there could be a vestibular problem. Those of you with a bit more anatomy and physiology of the vestibular system might turn around and say well it's very good that we can actually look at the vestibular ocular reflex but when we turn our head that activates both canals or both vestibular systems and when we're looking for diagnosing a vestibular problem it's really important that we can identify whether there's a problem on the left hand side or the right hand side so how can we actually use the video head impulse testing clinic what i want to do on the next few slides is to demonstrate how in fact actually if we move our head fast enough, this will actually only test one vestibular system. So let's start off with our experiment again. So what we've got is the dot in the middle of the screen. What I want you to do is to look at the dot. Now what I'm going to do is to draw two bar graphs on the side of each screen, one representing the left vestibular system and the other representing the right vestibular system. So what you'll find is that when you're looking at the dot on the screen, each vestibular system will actually be firing and sending neuronal information to the brain. Now, you might think this is odd because the vestibular systems aren't receiving any stimulus, i.e. the head is not moving, but this is what we call the spontaneous firing rate. So what happens is that each vestibular system, even when it's not being stimulated, is going to send a spontaneous neural activity to the brain. Well, what we should do now, then, is see what happens when we stimulate the vestibular system. So if we look at the dot, and if I ask you to keep looking at the dot, but now to move your head to the right in a slow fashion, what we'll see happens in the vestibular systems is something like this. So what we'll see is an increase in neuronal firing from the right vestibular system because the right system has been stimulated and vice versa, we'll see an inhibition or reduction in vestibular firing from the left vestibular system as this one undergoes inhibition. And that's going to cause our eyes to move in an equal and opposite direction to the head, so in this situation the eyes are going to move to the left. And by moving our eyes to the left we can maintain our vision on the target. But notice in this scenario that both vestibular systems are contributing to the overall response. We can see that there's activity in the left vestibular system, albeit reduced, and we can also see there's activity in the right vestibular system. Therefore, when we move our head slowly, we do not test one single system. We do, in fact, test both systems. So how do we test the single system? Well, let's bring our eyes back to the center, not move our head, and this will re-establish the spontaneous firing rate from the vestibular system. Now what I want to do is to ask you to move your head very briskly to the right. So looking at the dots, move your head very briskly to the right, and in doing so, what you'll find is something like this happens. So what we can see on the bar graphs now is there's much more firing in the right vestibular system. But actually, what we can see on the left vestibular system is that there's no spontaneous firing. There's no firing at all. In fact, the left system has been driven into complete inhibition and there's no actual neuronal activity. So when we move our head very quickly in one direction, then what this does is actually cancels out all activity from one vestibular system, allowing us only to test the vestibular system in which we've moved the head in the direction to. And this is the first really important point to take home with video head impulse testing or even just head impulse testing at the bedside. It's really important to make sure that the head movements are fast. If we make sure the head movements are fast enough, then we can actually obtain good impulses and isolate each vestibular system so that we know that we're only testing the side which we're thrusting the head in the direction of. So we know now 
how we need to move the head in order to make sure that we're only testing one vestibular system. So what happens in a patient with vestibular loss? We know that somebody with normal vestibular function will move their eyes in an equal and opposite direction to the head. So how will these differ? What's the clinical sign? This is a clinical head impulse test. So the doctor's holding the patient's head and what they're doing is looking at the doctor's face. They're asked to look at the doctor's nose. What the doctor will now do is thrust the head in leftwards and rightwards directions. And what we need to do is look at the eye movements to see if we can notice anything different to the eyes moving in an equal and opposite direction. So here we go. So we move the head to the patient's right. The patient maintains the target. To the left, we can see that the patient couldn't. The patient's eyes drift with the head movement and they have to make a corrective jump back. Let's have a look again. Corrective jump back. And it's this corrective jump back which tells us that there's a vestibular problem. This was first described by Halmagi and Kerfoys in the late 80s and has been applied to bedside testing ever since. For those of you that could not see the catch-up saccade, I'll quickly recap what happened. In a normal system, when the head moves, the eyes move in an equal and opposite to the head so that the eyes maintain the vision on the target. In an abnormal system, when the head moves in one direction, the eyes move with the head and have to make a corrective jump back. It's this corrective jump back which we classify as the clinical sign that there's a vestibular problem. This corrective jump back is known as a catch-up saccade, as it's the saccade system which generates this movement, not the vestibular ocular reflex. What we could also see with this uh, catch-up saccade was that it was clearly visible to us. It was quite easy to see that this woman could not maintain her vision on the target during leftward head impulses and she made the catch-up saccade. Because it's clearly visible, we call this an overt saccade. An overt saccade is where the catch-up saccade occurs when the head has stopped moving. A question that may fall into your heads at this point is okay, well if we can visibly see these catch-up saccades, then why do we need to invest in a video head impulse system which is going to record these catch-up saccades? Well, this can be nicely demonstrated by this video here. This video shows a colleague at Interacoustics. Uh, his name is Johannes and he works for the ABR OEE team. And uh, what we're going to do is do the impulses on Johannes. Now, with Johannes, he actually has a vestibular lesion. And uh, what we're going to do is look at his eyes and see if he can maintain the vision on the target. And what we can see is it appears that Johannes has completely normal function. There are no catch-up saccadic eye movements. He's maintaining the vision on, his, on the target and then eyes are not making any jumping back. Actually, what's happening in Johannes' system is, as we know, he isn't completely uh, normal in terms of his vestibular function. And therefore, what he's actually doing is he's compensated very well to his vestibular lesion and when the head is thrusted, his eyes are actually making these catch-up saccadic eye movements during the head movement. And this is too fast for our eyes to see as humans. So, in fact, what this tells us is that at the bedside without a video camera, we would think that Johannes is normal. However, when we put the video camera on Johannes and make recordings with the head impulses via the video, then what we can see is that he displays catch-up eye movements during the head movement. Because we can't see these corrective saccades, we call them covert saccades. So the second take-home point is that there's two types of saccades, overt saccades, which happen after the head movement and we can clearly see, and covert saccades, which occur during the head movement, which we cannot see, and we can only see with a video camera. So, what methods do we have in order to see these catch-up saccades? Well, as I mentioned, you can do a bedside test using direct observation. And as discussed, 
we described that although it's very good if the patient displays the catch-up saccade, we can classify them to have a vestibular lesion. However, if they do not uh, display a catch-up saccade, then this does not tell us very much information because we don't know whether they're displaying covert saccades or whether they're normal. So there is the limitation of the direct observation test. After direct observation, in fact, there was a different method which was developed, which was known as the scleral search coil. What this involves is placing a contact lens on the patient's eye and placing them in a large magnetic field. What that does is actually provides a very sensitive measure of eye movement in relation to head movement. So although this is a very sensitive test, unfortunately, it's just not very clinically friendly. Firstly, the contact lens is very uncomfortable and uh, patients will not tolerate that in a day-to-day -day clinical environment. The second is that the equipment is so bulky, you have to place the patient in a magnetic field and also what you have to do is the calibration process and expense of the equipment is just too much to be used in a general clinical environment. So although the search coil is a fantastic way of measuring these eye movements, it's just not clinically appropriate. So then developed the video head impulse test. With technology improving all the time, we now are able to record very high frame rates with video cameras. And by doing so, what we can do is detect these very small movements. And what has been shown is that the video camera and the IC cam in particular is shown to be identical in identifying these overt and covert saccades in the same way as which the scleral search curl can do in the lateral canals. This is a much more clinically friendly test because all we need to do is to place the goggle over the patient's eyes and then we're ready to perform testing straight away. So what does the goggle look like? Well it looks something like this. First of all you notice that the, the goggle looks very lightweight. You can see there's not much to it and the reason why there isn't much to it is because it has to be as light as possible. Any weight introduced into a goggle can potentially cause slippage so we need to keep the goggle super light. We do this by minimizing everything apart from the goggle and the strap. And the second thing we do is that we only use one video camera. You'll see on the goggle is that we can see we have a video camera here, but there's a ball and socket joint on each side of the camera. And by having this ball and socket joint, it means that we can take the camera and test both eyes. So it's important that we have the facility to test both eyes, but it's not so important to test both eyes at the same time. It's more important to have a lightweight goggle to prevent slippage. Inside the goggle, next to the camera, is something known as an inertial measurement unit. Now the inertial measurement unit is going to measure the head movement. So the camera will measure the eye movement, and the inertial measurement unit will measure the head movement. That sends the information along a USB wire and that connects to the PC. So let's talk about the measurement process. How do we actually record and perform the video head impulse test? And what I'm going to do today is focus uh, my attention on the diagnostic video head impulse test. There's two ways in which you can use the IC cam. The first is to perform a screening test where you don't do any calibration, you just put the goggle on and perform lateral canal impulses and then look at the results. The second is where we do a full diagnostic test where we're going to do a calibration to assess all six semicircular canals. So, as I mentioned, there's um, a few more steps involved in the diagnostic uh, setup. The first of these is that we need to set the patient up correctly. If we do not set the patient up in the appropriate manner, then we're not going to record the results which we need to be able to see. Secondly, with the diagnostic test, we need to perform the calibration. I put the question mark there because in a screening environment, we do not need to perform this step. Next, we're going to perform lateral canal impulses. And then lastly, we're going to do uh, vertical canal impulses. And we pair the vertical canals with the left anterior and the right posterior and the right anterior and the left posterior LARP and route impulses and we'll talk more about those later. 
So, let's firstly talk about how to set the patient up. The first thing to do is to make sure that the patient is sufficient distance away from a wall. So what we're going to do is we're going to place the patient 1.5 metres away from a wall which doesn't have any clutch on it, so a plain wall. Now, what we're going to do is eventually get the patient to look at a target on this wall. But uh, we need to make sure that the patient is far enough from the target to avoid something known as convergence. We say that the patient should be 1.5 metres or more away from this wall. In addition to being 1.5 metres away, we need to also make sure that the patient is not on a swivel chair. A swivel chair can actually cause the patient to move when you're doing the head impulses. You want the patient's body to be exactly still and you only want to move the head. So you make sure that they're on a static chair with four legs and that they're not going to be moving anywhere. So, we've got the patient in the correct uh, distance away from a blank wall, but now we need to give them a target to look at. Now this is very straightforward. All you need to do is measure a line directly across from the patient's uh, eyes, along to the wall, and then we just place the target at exactly eye level onto the wall. Once that's done, we're ready to continue and perform some calibrations. Before we can do the calibration of course we need to fit the goggle on and what I have is a video here which demonstrates how to do this. The important thing with fitting on the goggle is to make sure that it's tight and not to have any slippage. Here we can see Dr. Leonel Lewis placing a goggle over Johannes's eyes and what we can see is that he's firstly lining the goggle up so that the camera's facing and looking at the eye. He's then going to come around to the strap on the side and tighten it so it's nice and tight, so that there's not going to be any slippage. Lastly, he takes the USB cable and places it in the USB cable holder. It's really important that you don't want the USB cable to be flopping around or to be touched during the head impulses testing, as this can pull on the goggle and also introduce artifact. But when the goggle's set up like this, it did not take very much time at all we can see that we are ready for testing. With the goggle on, what we need to do in the software is make sure that the pupil is in the right place. So what you'll see is a uh, window in the top left hand screen of the software displaying the eye image. And our objective is to make sure that the pupil is in the centre of the image. If we find that the pupil is in this type of angle, the best way to correct for that is to make an oblique downwards roll movement with the camera. Rolling the camera will bring the pupil from the sides into the centre. Next what we need to do is to make sure that the lower eyelid is horizontal with the image frame. What we can see in this image is that this is not in line in, with the horizontal lower image and we're drifting up. Ideally what we'd like to see is this lower lid looking very flat and straight. And the way to correct that is to turn the camera clockwise to eliminate leftwards tilt and counterclockwise to eliminate rightwards tilt. We can see in this example we have leftwards tilt and therefore we would rotate the camera clockwise. the pupil was in the centre of the screen, what we need to do now is to move the pupil into not the top centre but the centre centre and this is very straightforward. To move the pupil down you just move the camera backwards or upwards and vice versa if you want to move the pupil up. There's a focus ring on the camera. We want to make sure that the eye is being displayed in the clearest possible fashion and you want to turn the focus ring until you can see the iris pattern at its most clearest. One thing to also note on this uh, setup or this picture is that there's two reflection uh, lasers here or two reflection lights visible. These are not desirable to be within this green circle region. The green circle region is where we're going to be measuring the eye movement from and these can produce artifacts if they're present inside it. So what we recommend to do is just tilt the head very slightly forward or maybe 5 to 10 degrees and this will eliminate these reflections. 
So we have the goggle on, we have the camera in the correct place, now we're ready to do a calibration. There's two types of calibration to perform. The first is an eye calibration and the second is a head calibration. Let's start with the eye calibration first. What we'll do is if we press play, what we're going to have is the doctor present the camera into calibration mode. That's going to then produce a laser which is going to um, project onto the wall. He's just adjusting the camera here and then what you want to do is adjust the laser so that it's the center dot is looking at the green target on the wall. Then you're going to ask the patient to look left, look right, look up and look down and during that movement that's going to calibrate the eye movement independently to that patient. The way that you perform the calibration is that you ask the patient to look at leftward, rightwards, upwards and downwards dots as directed by the software. Once the patient has looked at all five dots, then it will generate a calibration report. This is what the calibration report looks like, and what you'll see is two images. The first is an eye in image, and the second is an eye in space. So the first thing to look for is to ensure that there are five black circles. These ensure that the patient has fixated on each of the five dots. You want these five black circles, of course, to appear like a cross shape. Once you've inspected the eye in image, then you can inspect the eye in space and look to see if we're getting a cross shape. So we're wanting to see a, you want to see a line along the zero horizontal degrees axis and also a line along the vertical degrees axis at zero. And this will tell you that you have a good calibration. If for some reason you can't get these results despite several attempts, there is a default calibration in the device which can be used. And this default calibration is the one which is used when we're using a screening team. So the next thing we need to do is to do a head calibration. The head calibration is only necessary if you're going to perform vertical canal impulses. And what it does is it calibrates the inertial measurement unit within the goggle. So if we press play, we can see the steps. You ask the patient to look at the dot straight ahead. And what you're going to do is you're going to twist the patient's head or move the patient's head in the yaw and pitch directions. So nodding no, leftwards to rightwards, and nodding up and down in a yes direction. What you want to do is to make sure that you're moving the head between 80 and 100 degrees per second and you can do this either passively, meaning the patient moves their head, or actively, meaning the clinician moves the patient's head. Once you have performed five cycles in both the yaw and the pitch plane, you get a report that looks like this. Just like the eye calibration report, we're looking to see a black line along this axis here, a vertical black line along this axis here, and a cross along this axis here. As long as these fall within the first quadrants, then we accept the calibration to be acceptable. You can actually see the black dots represent the calibrated head movement, and we can see here on this diagram there's some grey dots. They represent the raw head movement which was performed during the calibration. So we've now performed a head calibration and an eye calibration, so we're ready to perform some head impulses. So what we're going to do now is to first start off and do the lateral canals, as these are the most important ones to perform, as they contain the most diagnostic information. So with lateral canal impulses, it's really important to get these right. And I have four tips for you in order to make sure that you're getting the best possible results you can. So before we look at the technique, what I want to do is to give you the four tips. The first thing is that you need to make sure that the impulses are rapid and unpredictable, both in direction and in time. The other thing that you need to do is make sure that they're small in amplitude. A common thing I see when people are new to the video head impulse test is that they try making huge movements of the head, but in fact it only requires very small movements of the head between 10 and 15 degrees. And I've outlined these boundaries, the 15 degree boundary, 
on this image here. So you can see that it's only a very small movement which you need to do. As we talked about at the start of the webinar, the head movement needs to be very fast. It needs to be 150 degrees per second or greater. If you can do those three tips, then all you need to do is to measure five to 10 impulses in each direction. I've made a little video or animation of how this works. So first of all, I'm going to impulse the head to the left. We can see that it was a very quick movement. The patient's looking at the target and I've done it of about 10 degrees. Now what I'm going to do is move the patient's head back. They're still looking at the target. I'm now going to move the head, make it unpredictable. So this time I'm going back to the left to try and trick them as they might have expected it was going to the right. Again, I've made a movement of about 11 degrees this time and it was very fast above 150 degrees per second. I'm now going to move the head back to the center and on the next movement to the opposite direction. This keeps it unpredictable. Again, I've moved about 12 degrees. It was very quick and I move back to the center. So all I need to do is five to 10 in each direction and then I'm finished the lateral canal impulses. So we know how to move the head, but how do we move the head? And this is a video um, of one of the ways which we can do it using the hands on the jaw technique. We can see that the doctor has his hands placed on the patient's jaw. He has his thumbs placed at the back of the patient's head. He's making very short, brief impulse movements in leftwards and rightwards directions which are unpredictable. When you have your hands on the patient's jaw, it's important to make sure that they have their jaw clenched, not necessarily very tightly, but you don't want to be moving the jaw and not the head. You want to be moving the whole head. So you want to ask the patient to clench their jaw and then to look at the target. And if you're doing these very brisk movements without touching the USB cable, just as the doctor did in the video, then this is a sufficient way to do the lateral canal impulses. An alternative way is to position the hands on the top of the head. This is entirely acceptable and it's down to you as your individual preference which way you prefer to do the impulses. As I said, we need to make sure that the impulses are fast. But don't worry if you can't tell how fast they are because the software will tell you if they're good enough. What we have in the software is a training guide. And you'll see that if the impulse is of sufficient speed, you'll get a green tick. What we can see in this graph is the raw data we've obtained. So what we're particularly interested in at this point is looking at the head movement, because we need to make sure the head movement is correct. This is displayed in the gray line here. And what you want to see is the gray line to fit within this red sh shaded boundary. If the gray line falls within this red shaded boundary, then it tells us that the head velocity is appropriate. We also need to make sure that the peak of this um, head movement is occurring by 80 milliseconds. If this occurs before 80 milliseconds, which is denoted here, then the impulse will not be counted. But if the impulse falls within the criteria, we get a green tick. If it falls outside the criteria, we get a red cross telling us that the impulse is not of sufficient quality. So that was the lateral canals. Let's move on and discuss the vertical canals. With vertical canal testing, we have four canals in the vertical plane, and these are paired in coplanar pairs, which means the left anterior canal is not paired with the right anterior canal, but in fact, it's paired with the right posterior semicircular canal. So what we do is to stimulate both these canals, we need to measure in the anterior direction and the posterior direction and we call these LARP impulses, left anterior, right posterior. Then to measure the other two vertical canals we measure in the opposite direction so we test the right anterior and the left posterior. So in order to measure the impulses from this patient to measure the left anterior if you have the patient looking at a target directly in front of you, 
you're going to be pushing the head down at a 45 degree angle. To test the right anterior canal with the patient looking at a target at 0 degrees, you're going to be pushing the head down at a 45 degree angle to the right. If we're going to now stimulate the left posterior, patient looking at the 0 degrees target, we're going to be pulling the head back and pulling the head 45 degrees to the left to stimulate the left posterior canal. And lastly, with the patient looking at 0 degrees target in front of them, we will pull the head backwards 45 degrees to the right to stimulate the right posterior canal. In terms of the movement, they take the same criteria as the lateral canal movement. They need to be small, they need to be fast, they need to be unpredictable. The one thing with the vertical canals is that I wouldn't go for very, very high velocities. Uh, you get much clearer results if you keep your velocities around 150 degrees per second. Uh, the recordings will be much nicer and clearer. But again, we have the animation to show how this is going to work. So we're going to thrust the head. It doesn't matter which canal we're stimulating. I just want to show you the way in which you would do it. So we're thrusting the head. We're going to test thrust downwards. And we've thrusted the head downwards at 15 degrees. That was a fast movement. And what we're going to do is bring the head back to center. We're going to make it unpredictable. We're going to thrust up this time. Again, we've done 15 degrees, the patient's still looking at the target, and we've done it in a very fast fashion. We're going to bring the head back to the center, keep it unpredictable, keep it fast, keep it small. We move upwards, 15 degrees, patient's still looking at the target, and we can complete 5 to 10 impulses in each direction to finish the vertical canals. So... Again, how do we do the vertical canal measurements? Well, we have two methods at injury acoustics we, which we recommend. The first one is to have the patient looking at a target at zero degrees. The second involves the patient looking at a target uh, with their head turned 45 degrees. So this is technique one, patient looking at zero degrees. In this situation, we can see the planes of the canals when the head is pointing at zero degrees. So we know that we need to be moving the head forwards and backwards in 45 degree direction. We can see that we're stimulating the lar canals. So that means left anterior, so we're moving the head downwards and towards the left. And right posterior, so backwards and towards the right. With the patient looking at the target straight ahead, this is what we're going to be testing with the lar plane. The route plane would be the opposite. Head forward right, head backwards left in the 45 degree plane. In order to ensure that you're stimulating the correct plane, there's a training guide in the software which shows you a blue shaded region and a red shaded region. You want the black and grey lines to fall within that region to show that you stimulated the correct canal. The next method that we have involves turning the patient's head 45 degrees so that what this does is it lines the canals up. So you move, turn the head 45 degrees in the direction opposite to the anterior canal which you're testing. So with LARP impulses we're going to turn the head to the right. This is going to place the left anterior canal at 0 degrees. This time we just pull, push the head forward and backwards by 10 to 15 degrees and this is sufficient for testing. There's two ways which you can do the test, just like the lady's doing with her hands on the head or you can place the hands one on the top of the head and one on the chin. It's up to you. But again, what you want to do is during the test make sure that you're stimulating the correct canal. So make sure that the black line falls within the correct area. Red for right posterior and blue for left anterior. So once we have all this information we're ready to stop the test and we can remove the goggle from the patient. 
Once we have removed the goggle from the patient, we can then make the interpretation. As I mentioned, interpretation is going to be talked a lot about during the next webinar. What I want to show you is what an overt and covert saccade look like so that you can immediately make some form of interpretation regarding these traces. So what we're showing is a graph showing time on this axis and then we have um, degrees per second, so velocity, on this axis. And what we're going to do is to compare the eye on the bottom graph in this situation and the head on the top graph. And what we're going to expect to see is that in a patient with normal vestibular system, as the head moves, slows down and stops, what we expect to see is the eye to move in an equal and opposite direction to the head. If it moves in an equal and opposite direction to the head, then we classify this to be absolutely fine. What happens though when we have a patient with vestibulus problem? Well, one scenario could happen like this. We can see that the head is moved and stopped. But the eye is also moved, but it's not moved in an equal and opposite direction to the head. And because of this, what we can see is that in fact, there has then been a secondary movement after the head has stopped. And this is the corrective eye movement. This is what we're able to see. So this is eye moves unequally to the head, a catch-up saccade has been made, and it happens after the head has stopped moving, because the head stops moving here, we see the catch-up saccade, and we call this an overt catch-up saccade because it's happened after the head and we can see it. And this is just what we saw with the lady in the first video which we saw during the webinar, the overt catch-up saccade. But what about Johannes? What would his V hit show? Well, his would show something like this. The eye still moves unequally to the head, but this time what we get is a catch-up saccade during the head movement. We can see the head is moving and the catch-up saccade is being generated even before the head has stopped moving. And that makes it impossible for us to be able to see it. But the camera can very clearly see there's this catch-up or corrective movement and that is going to tell us that a vestibular pathology exists. So we're looking firstly for the eye to move unequally to the head being moved. Then secondly, we're looking then for a corrective movement back so that the eye can then focus on the target again. If it happens after the head has stopped moving, we call this an overt saccade. If it happens during the head movement, we call it the covert saccade. Once all six canals have been done, you'll get this plot called the IC6 plot, which shows you all six semicircular canals being tested, their respective gains, and whether they have any overt or covert saccades. And we'll talk more about this in more detail in the next webinar series in September. So this brings us to the end of my presentation on performing the video head impulse test on all six semicircular canals. What I would like to say is really just take home the messages that the impulses need to be fast, they need to be unpredictable, and they need to be short in movement. With that in mind, I welcome any questions. Thank you, Lee. As Lee said, we are now open for questions, so please feel free to, to type them in. In the meantime, uh, I just want to pay, uh, bring your attention to the upcoming webinars. This webinar is a part of a, a long series of, of webinars conducted by Interacoustics Academy. Um, as you can see here, we've already last month had webinars in the ABR area. We Yesterday and today we had this webinar concerning video head impulse testing. And on June 17th and June 18th, we will have uh, webinars uh, concerning hearing threshold estimation. So you can find this information on, on Interacoustics Academy. You can also find them on the extranet and you can sign up there. You can also find uh, a link directly to the webinar so um, you are able to attend by just one click. Again, feel free to, to type in any questions you might have. Um, 
we are willing to to uh, answer them. Again, as I said in the beginning, this webinar will be recorded and will be available online. Um, it will probably be available in the beginning of, of next week. So please keep an eye on, on, on the uh, Interacoustics Extranet and on the Academy website. You'll find a direct link to Interacoustics Academy on uh, interacoustics.com as well. Also, there will be future webinars as well, and you will receive the information about these webinars uh, by newsletters. Um, so keep an eye on your email. If you don't receive newsletters, then please uh, make sure that you are registered in our system. You can send me a mail, or you can send your regional sales manager a, ma a mail and ask them to make sure you get these information. I don't see any questions coming in. Um, I am sure, Lee, please correct me if I'm wrong, that you are welcome to send Lee uh, a, an email directly if you have any questions. Absolutely, that's absolutely fine. And my email address, I'm sure Helen will write it up in the instant messaging uh, space, but it's lma at interacoustics.com. So please, if you do think of any questions, then uh, fire them across to me, and we can go from there. Perfect. Yes, that, I think that's all for now. Uh, yeah, please feel free to to ask Lee any questions. Please keep an eye on your mailbox and on Intercruisics Extranet and Intercruisics Academy website for information about future web webinars. You will also find recordings from 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 past webinars if and there might be an, a subject interesting for you there. So please go and, uh, and search the world of interacoustics webinars. Um, so for now, I'd like to thank you all for joining, and uh, I wish you all a good day. And thank you very much again for attending. I'm very grateful.